Pablo. Hey, Dominic, how are you? I am excellent. Thank you so much for joining us here. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, as you probably know, and as you've probably seen in your office, there's a lot of talk and a lot of uh, confusion about the new free trade deal between United States, Canada, and Mexico. And uh, I, I had to use all of my connections to find you in Mexico as a trade <laughs> specialist, right? Because there's some serious things going on for all manufacturers, and, and that's what we have here. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you, Pablo. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a new deal, and it's complicated, like any other new deal. Starting with the name, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, starting with the name. It has to change, right? Exactly, exactly. But, well, if I can help, I'll be more than happy to help you, help your audience in any way we can. Thank you. Well, why don't we start by letting the audience know who you are and what you do and how you come to be on the Cabinet Maker Profit System podcast, talking to manufacturers throughout North America and really the world, actually. But uh, tell us who you are and a little bit about you. Sure. I'm, I'm, well, my name is Pablo Maldonado. I'm a Mexican national. I live in Puebla, Mexico, which is like 90 kilometers east Mexico City. And I work, I'm a senior partner at HLB International, which, as you know, you are, we are an accountants and advisors firm all over the world. Mm -hmm. I'm the senior partner in my firm in Puebla. And it looks like I speak a little bit of English. I'm the international contact. <laughs> so I'm, I've been doing this for like, I don't know, longer than I would like to remember, 30 years or so. I'm 50 years old. And uh, well, this is what I do every day. It, yeah. It, it is the only thing I can do, and I know how to do it. Well, and I, I originally met uh, uh, one of your network of financial advisors, uh, Darren Millard from Facet Advisors, he's already been on here giving a Canadian perspective on the trade deal. Okay. And that's how you and I met. And then I said, well, we need a Mexican perspective. I'm not putting a challenge out there, but I still have yet to find an American to give us an American perspective. Okay. <laughs> and for all of my listeners, I promise it's coming. Okay. Um, now for all of our listeners too, Pablo, your last name, Sure sounds Italian, Maldonado Altieri. Altieri, yes, my, my grandfather on my mom's side was from Naples, Italy. Mm -hmm. And well, a little town south Naples called Rivello. Uh -huh. Beautiful place in the, all over, on the mountain. Oh. And, um, so I'm, I'm half Italian, half Mexican. I love it. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Italian Canadian, if that makes any sense. My parents were born my father was born in a small town called Bitrito, which is in Bari, in Puglia, Italy. Mm -hmm. And my mom's from an even smaller town in Calabria, which is basically a few homes that are perched on rocks in the mountains. Uh, set it, it really close to Sera San Bruno and um, Cosenza. Okay, okay. So, beautiful place. It's, town, it's called Cerva, but it's very small. But it's beautiful. Oh, it's, it's stunningly beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, and... Here we are, uh, you know, they immigrated to Canada and, and here I am. So interesting how the world works and, and we, you know, we weave our way together. But um, tell us a little bit about your, your perspective on this new trade deal and where the opportunities and perhaps uh, challenges are for the manufacturers who are listening. Well, the new agreement, well, we needed a new agreement, you know, the, the old one, NAFTA, was signed a quarter of a century ago mm. when we didn't have any e-commerce, for example. The automotive industry has grown dramatically from 25 years ago to now. Yeah. So we needed a new, a new agreement. This is the, the best and the most important justification for, for the three governments to start a new one or to adjust one. Make makes perfect sense. Mm. So we needed a new one. We are different countries now. The thing is that we should focus it on a specific markets or in a specific issues in, in these markets. Basically, for, from our side, Mexico, agriculture, and automotive. 
But with agriculture and automotive, we had a big problem, which is labor. All right. So we, now we're talking about three different things. So Mexico's perspective is that our salaries are lower, of course. Yeah. We're a third world country in the process, but we're a third world country doing business with first world countries. So we, we understand that it's complicated for Canada and the United States, obviously. But we have every automotive industry in Mexico, every brand of cars, trucks, they're here. Yeah. So we needed to, to face something. We needed to deal with something on one side. On the other side, agriculture is a major business in Mexico. Yeah. We are a big country, not as big in, in, in geographically speaking as Canada and the United States, but we are a big country. We, we're North America. And uh, we needed to, we were facing difficulties dealing with this border process with our products. So major justification, a new agreement was needed. And basically, from our perspective, automotive and agriculture. And within those both labor, labor costs. Yeah. So this is the most important, these were the most important things. Yeah, facing that border challenge with manufacturing products, the, the movement. What are, are there trends that you're seeing? Have, have things changed since the, the new USMCA deal has come in? Or, or you mean since it was signed or before the... <laughs> you know, that's a good question. What, what has been the history leading up to that? And now that it's signed, are you starting to see early indicators of change? We, well, from our client's point of view in, in Mexico, the new deal has increased in, second, in seconds, sorry, business perspectives. Oh, really? Lots of um, European automotive industries are here, Germany, mainly. Right. Yeah. Because where I live, in, in our hometown, we have a Volkswagen plant, huge. 16,000 workers plus 50,000 around. So it's a, it's a huge industry. Mainly, right. and we have an Audi plant also, 20 minutes away from home. So all these German companies, in, in seconds, increase business opportunities with the New Deal. Oh. So you have other cars like cars from Daimler Chrysler, for example, who's doing business in Mexico, and now they're open to new suppliers because the New Deal gives this, let's say, benefits. Right. So yes, since the, since the agreement was signed, opportunities were open. Now, I mean only opportunities, because we still have to understand how this works. Right. On cars, automotive industry, something very specific changed, and this is very important. The old NAFTA accepted 65, no, 45, I believe, so 65% of a, of a car yeah. only in, in the United States. Now it demands a 75%. Oh. So it, it, it makes it a little bit complicated for, for, for us because- and, that, and that's only automotive, or is that- That, that is only automotive. Only that automotive? Only automotive. Okay. And then the workers working on automotive must earn a minimum wage right. that United States, Canada, and Mexico established. And it was around, I have a note right here, they must earn at least $16 an hour. 16, one six. One six. So if a Mexico company wants to export automotive parts of vehicles, yeah. So in the States or Canada, every worker that, who, who works in, the, in this automotive industry must earn at least $16, $16 an hour. Ah. This is a major change because it pushes up Mexico's wages. Yeah. It, obviously. It's good for the country, of course. It's good for workers. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge change. <laughs> this is what we pay here, right? So it's... Well, 
even on that point alone, I think my listeners, because my listeners are here because they build finished wood products, whether it's furniture or cabinetry, architectural millwork in any of its shapes and forms. And, and that is a big part of the concern is we know Mexico's wage base is lower. And so the, I think you've just given a little shining piece of light to everybody saying, okay, well, hang on, at least in automotive, they have to have some sort of wage stabilization. What my listeners are going to hear and translate from that and say, well, if people know they're going to get $16 at the Volkswagen or Audi plant, now the cabinet making plant has to be somewhere in that range too. And that evens out the labor differentials for producing product. And so they can come down here. Yeah. They have to because of, because of geographic conditions, nature, or qualified uh, labor, labor work or, or whatever, because wages will be more civilized or level yeah. in, in three countries. Yeah. Regardless, coming down here on this industry, for example, has a limit. This is a major change for us. It has we a limit. 2.6 million cars a year in the United States on the new agreement. Right. So this limits a, a bit, or a huge bit, <laughs> what we can do here. And but this also is on the automotive, automotive side, Pablo. It, it does, it, do you know if it limits the woodworking or the, the finished wood trades? Only automotive. Only automotive. Okay. Yeah. It's like in Canada where you guys live, Canada opened open a little bit the dairy production. Because it's now open for turkey, chicken, eggs, a little bit more open. Canada's milk industry is one of the biggest in the world. They didn't want to open it like that. I can understand that. But they open it a little bit now. Mm -hmm. We don't have that big production agricultural dairy product, but we do have some. Yeah. It's an option now for us. So there are opportunities then in Mexico. Let, let's look at it from a, an opportunity perspective, because now you've painted a picture a little bit of that cross-border trade potential. So we have the potential. What's the opportunity? Are you seeing Canadian or American companies coming to Mexico to set up manufacturing plants to export into Canada and the United States? Well, Dominic, over the last six months, my reference work from the United States and Canada has increased, I don't know, something around 30, 35%. Whoa. Only in six months. <laughs> Questions, of course, not always done business or done deals. Yeah. But lots of companies or colleagues from, from the firm yeah. sending questions, asking for questions, because they have clients over there with opportunities seen and they want to understand how things work down here. Yeah. In Mexico, we are, we are a funny country. We, we understand, we understand we have this scenario in the world where it seems that safety is a, a major issue and it is, but in only specific parts of the country. It is not like we're in this war zone. It is not like that. I am glad to hear that because it sounds bad when the news gets here. There are some places, of course. Yeah. But they are located in a part. They are Mexico, sure, but they are located in a specific areas, zones. Yeah. Where I live, we live like in like in any other part in the world. So Mexico City, Puebla, and some other places, lots. You can come down here and make business with lots of safety. Otherwise, right. All of these foreign European companies wouldn't be here. Of course, yeah. Right? So, yes, 30%, 35% has increased over the last six months. So that begs the question. Question on taxes, question on borders, questions on, on labor. Yeah. Companies interested in coming down here. Yes, it has increased with a new agreement. That's, that's very interesting and potentially... This is where clever business owners start to think outside the box. What, what does the opportunity, what does it take to set up a business in Mexico if you're not a Mexican national? And is there a benefit to doing so? Great question. Doing, I mean, is there a benefit? There's one. You can, whatever tax you pay here is creditable back home. 
Oh, if you're, if you're a foreign company. Yeah. I mean, in a general speaking perspective, yeah, you pay tax here. Remember, Mexico has free trade, uh, double taxation agreements with Canada and the United States. Yeah, specific ones. These tre these treaties are based on on one big principles. Companies should not pay tax twice. Thank you. Tax, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But if you pay the tax in Mexico, you should create a tax back home. Right. Or if you pay the tax in the United States or Canada, yeah. you should pay it back here. So I see. this is one big, I don't know, benefit. This, of course, is where an accountant like you or Darren comes very handy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is why I mentioned it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so now there's this one big benefit. The yeah. other one is that you don't actually have to be here as a company to do business. There's this legal tax figure that's permanent establishment, which, which is more, let me put it this way, it's more virtual. Uh -huh. It can be a Canadian company with a permanent establishment here, which is just a small office that handles whatever business you're doing in the country. Uh, so there's no residency requirement to own a in business? First, in first hand, you, you, you don't, there's nothing. You can do business right here with this permanent slam. You will, you will only need one person, a legal representative, and that's it. So it's quite, it's quite simple. Yeah, OK, neat, a legal representative. So on, on, on your first question, you need a legal representative, of course. Yeah. In, in, I mean, I would suggest a, a Mexican national. It could be a Canadian. It could be a, an American. A Mexican would be better. You need to choose the type of company you want to work with. I mean, you can choose a limited liability company. You can choose an S corporation. You can choose. You need well, to define the type of company. Are those very similar to the United States structure? S corp. Exactly. Are pretty much the same. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know so that. Okay. We have a different denomination, of course. Yeah. But the bylaws are pretty much the same. I've been working with, with lots of them. Right. So we work in some cases with something that's called check the box, which is we have the same company on your country that in mind. So we're dealing we're dealing with the same thing. Uh interesting that they not that they normalized that language at that level. I don't know if that was intentional or not. It, I think it was, yeah. but it has been for the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, good. Okay. So you need to choose the type of company you, you, you would like to create or form. Mm. You need a legal representative, number two. Yep. And you need to understand timing, Dominic, and this is very important. Still, setting up a company in Mexico, it could be as fast or as slow as your contact person. Let, let's say me, you contact me, we can make a deal in 15 days. That, that's fast. Yeah. Well, then we have to go to authorities, local authorities, tax authorities, economic authorities to ask for registers, inscriptions, permissions. Wow. Water, electrical. All these kinds of things will take at least 10 to 15 weeks. Ah, so 10 to 15 days or 15 days for your side of setting up the proper tax structure, but then 10 to 15 weeks for infrastructure. Exactly. And then, and if you have a deadline because you already have a client here, yeah, you should maybe take under consideration that it will take some time to set the business set up, to have the business set up and ready for work to, to begin. What's the labor availability there? Good question. There, there's there's availability of labor unless it's a specialized labor. Depends, of course, on the type of industry. But if you need a special or specific skills, yeah. you, you, you will face some, some problems, of course. And with labor, and maybe it's like in Canada or in the United States, not everybody will have English skills. Well, of course, yeah. So this would be a, a problem. I don't know if a major problem, but it would be a problem. Or an opportunity. 
If you have, oh, of course, of course. if you're already a, a border uh, state manufacturer like Arizona or Texas, you might already have that intellectual property in your company to be able to do uh, trade in, in Mexican Spanish. Yes, right? of course. Yeah. Our biggest problem has been for the for those foreign companies to understand the bureaucracy in Mexico, if I may, these 10 weeks of setting up a bank account, getting a tax ID, yeah. getting an economic uh, permission, going to public records to register your company, all these kinds of things. They are not complicated, Dominic. They are just slow. Right. And it's a process that's different than we might be used to wherever we are. Exactly. And, and, and I've seen businessmen from, from Europe, from Canada and from the United States desperate on this. I can understand that. But it is what it is. And we cannot change it. I can help you with the tax structure, with the accounting structure. Mm. We can help hiring staff. We can help hiring operators for your company. But I cannot speed up the process with government. It's, it's, I, it's, I, think, I think, Pablo, that's the same in every country in the world. In the world. <laughs> red tape, we call it red tape. And red tape is just red tape. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and it is not especially for Mexico. You, you understand from Italy, I can understand from Italy. <laughs> the clients over there, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just frustrating. Um, so let me, let me ask this, because this, the, the people listening will be asking this question just at face value. Is it worth it to set up manufacturing operations in Mexico from a cost perspective, from a quality perspective, from a supply of raw materials perspective? Is it worth it, in your mind, to set up operations in Mexico? I would say it is. Wow. And I would say it is because of two major things. One, we have this import programs with benefits. Mm -hmm. So if you set up a company in Mexico and you bring down materials, raw materials or machinery, whatever, to Mexico, yeah. there are import programs that keeps you away from taxes, custom taxes, etc. It's 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 a very important and useful product for 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 import things mm -hmm. into Mexico. It's, it's, it's been working for a few years now, and it helps companies not to pay customs taxes. Right. Very important, very important. From quality, raw material, it's as, I mean, it could be as good as in any other country in North America, depending on the industry. But I'll say this, we don't have this extreme weather in this country. Ah. Uh -huh. So we don't have snow pretty much all over the country. There's only some snow in northern Mexico in yeah. just a month or less yeah. than that. There's a warm, a warm country. So you don't have weather problems, the weather conditions for agriculture, yeah. furniture, for wood. I mean, the weather conditions are great all over the world, all over the years. So. Yeah, that's, that's, actually, that's an actu actually an interesting piece of information that many people might overlook because the, um, the humidity values of wood and how wood changes its relation to humidity as it travels is an important consideration for different um, uh, GIS or quality assurance standards. Yeah, interesting that you bring that up. Yeah, so on, on, on geographical conditions and weather, this is a great place. Yeah. On tax, of course, we don't have a very competitive income tax rate with Canada and United States. For the company, our income tax is 30%. With the tax reform in the United States, the income tax rate is 21. Yeah. So ours is not competitive, but still, whatever tax you pay here, you can credit it back home. So even if you pay a lot here, you will not pay as much going back home if you consolidate your companies. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a more complicated process. We right. cannot get into it because there's technicalities. So our lack of competitiveness with income tax has some benefits going back home. I see. So it might seem 
difficult uh, at face value, but you apply that income tax in your country of residence, and then there is there's a potential benefit. Yes, because on the other hand, we have a bigger income tax, and we have BAT like like United States and Canada, yeah. but we have local or state tax sales tax. We don't have. Ah, okay. So on on commerce on buying and selling stuff, we don't have an additional tax like in the United States and some parts of Canada. So, so your companies kind of compensate income tax with indirect taxes. You have to, it sounds like it, it takes uh, research. It, it's not something just to say, I'm going to drop everything and go to Mexico for a, uh, a workforce, an available workforce and a lower average rate. It takes more research than that. There's pluses and minuses that have to be. Yeah, it takes research because you have to define the tax effect yeah. long term and short term. Yeah. Of course, you you have your 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 audience should take under consideration that everything will be cheaper here without losing quality. I mean, it's just that. It's cheap to buy things here, raw materials and, and whatever you need for your industry will be cheaper here. Right. And the distribution networks, because the automotive industry is so strong, then the distribution networks, I mean, something as simple as freight, if you were going to build things in Mexico and, and ship it into the United States or up to Canada, the freight networks are already established because I assume they're already taking engine parts and car parts back and forth. Of it, they have been established and they work and they've been working for for a few years now I yeah mean, yeah more than 50 years so we have great let's say highways trucking companies railroads airplanes we had this new airport project in mexico city that for some political reasons which i don't i don't know and i don't even try to evaluate or get into it something happened we have a new president so there's always there's always something. Something? Yeah. Well, we have, we have lots of airports. Yeah. Freight, freight is not a problem, to be honest. Yeah. Interesting. I, I wonder if, you know, I guess the question is, is it worth it? And that's how we started this piece of the conversation. Is it worth it? And I, I suppose you'd have to be a certain size of manufacturer before you considered uh, opening up operations down there. But I'm sure you have architectural mill workers and cabinet makers already yeah, sure. I mean they have to be there because you know I see a door behind you and that's probably fire rated and that requires cores <laughs> veneering everything that goes with it right yeah but the, but remember we are a 120 million people country so it's not that small this is a big market yeah. even for domestic market 120 million people so so you will have market here, of okay. course, and you will have business opportunities to produce here and go back to Canada or the United States because your production costs will be lower. And you can work with quality issues, training staff here, yeah. and you will have materials with, with, with good quality also from, from, from the land, from, from the country. Right. So from a business perspective, big perspective, there's an opportunity coming down here because Mexico is eager on getting new investments. We yeah. were worried something, I mean, things got slow last, the end of the year, 18, because we had this presidential election and in every, in every country in the world, some things kind of slow yeah. down. Yeah, things happen, right? Now, it, it has happened two months ago, and, and everything is back on track. And we're working like, like always. Yeah. Let's, um, let's change gears a little bit, still within the, the, this conversation. But have you found people coming down with the wrong expectations for setting up a business? What are some things that you find? I mean, you mentioned one in that the bureaucracy it is what it is, but you mentioned one of those. What's another expectation we might have that's incorrect? Our, our biggest problem with foreigners coming down here to make business persons or companies is when they don't 
have a business advisor or a consultant back home in the in in, in the homeland. Uh -huh. When they come by their own and they kind of look for us or for, for people like me without first having a adversary in, in the home country. So when they come, they come blind because they haven't asked. So their first impression is us. Maybe they should have come first back home yeah. with a business consultant, mm. international business consultant, to help them to understand the big picture and then come back to us. Right. With a basic knowledge, basic, of course, on what to expect. Because international business consultants in Canada and in the United States know this general scenario of what they should be facing when they come down to Mexico. Right. And they call, they contact us and give us the first hand impression. You know, uh, this, sir, this company will call you, will contact you. They have this expectation. I have already explained them, blah, 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 one, two, three. So be ready. This is what they need to know. Yeah. So our biggest problem, Dominic, is when they come blind. Yeah. They should That's first have a business consultant home on international affairs. Right. And then contact a, bus a serious business consultant in Mexico. And when I, when I say serious, I would say somebody from a recognized business firm. My, ours, or any other ones, but don't go to the first one you <laughs> see on the internet. No? Yeah, yeah. Find it through a referral, a trusted source. Yes, and two, first, don't come down blind. And second, try to understand bureaucracy. It will take some time. We will get it done, but it will take some time. Did so, you say don't, 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 uh, was it bureaucracy you said? Don't. Exactly. Expect bureaucracy. Yeah. It will not take a year, of course, it will, but it will take some time. Yeah. This, this will be our two major factors of disappointment in, in, in foreign companies coming down to Mexico, I would say. Yeah. It's interesting that you say don't come down blind. Be, uh, you know, I, I, another way to say that is have your own house in order first. You should have your business operations in, let's just say Nebraska. You should have your business operations in Nebraska solid before you seek to expand because otherwise all you will do is repeat your problems in another country, which increases complexity by not 1% and not 10%, by a million percent. You have communication, time, distance issues, supply, people, language. You know, you really have to make sure your house is in order before you try to create a second house. Uh, yes, totally. And you know what else? If your house is not in order, you don't know what you need. Yeah, yeah. You have to know what you need or what you want. You know, I want to set up a business in Mexico. Okay, what kind of business? What type of business? What will you do? How it will help your business in Canada? Is it a, a supplementary business? Is it a different business? It is a subsidiary. If you come down here blind, we will work months and months and months without knowing exactly what do you need, why you came down here in the first place. So it's a waste of time and money. Yeah, business, exactly. A business plan <clears throat> would, be, would be very handy, if I may. <laughs> and then share the business plan with us. Right. And we can work something out. But first, like you, you pointed out perfectly, put your business back home in order, have a business idea, and share it with us. And we can say quite in a very simple way, if it is doable in Mexico, if it, is, if it does exist already, if there's a market value, if there's an opportunity, mm. etc. But But first... Put, put the house in order, yes. So I've got my, uh, my entrepreneur hat on now, my businessman hat. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about the situation of starting a business in, in Mexico, I'm now asking the question, what if I partner 
with an existing business there and create a contract relationship. So I don't, I don't go through the risks and the time of starting my own operations, but I find somebody who I trust in Mexico to, to create whatever it is I need done. Can you tell us what that process would look like? Who are the, what are the names of the types of people, not the person, but you know, what's that title called of somebody who finds you that strategic partner? And then what are the contract law? I know you're not a lawyer, but give me some perspectives on that from, from an accountant's perspective. And you're a high level financial advisor and accountant. So you, you, you work with these kind of people anyway. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would, it, it's a very good option, actually. In the new agreement, Dominic includes a, a, a very serious settlement dispute agreement whenever you're doing business like you just said. It, was, it is pretty much the one we had on, with NAFTA yeah. with, my, with minor changes. I would go to the Chamber of Commerce all over the country in Mexico, and they have the lists of companies that are ready or open to do business or new business or to engage with, with foreign companies. Right. One. Or you can contact, again, business firms like ours to try and find out a company that would like to set up a business together. After this, Dominic, and you, as, as this is very important, since it will not be your own business, the most important time you need to spend is on the contract. There are international contracts already in place. There are clauses already defined for international contracts. But again, you will need a business advisor back home. Yeah. And getting in contact with the business advisor here in Mexico. Lots of companies do this, Dominic, lots. It's a little bit more complicated because with this, you will have to deal with, I don't know, help me out with the, name, with the word in English, idiosyncrasy, does it oh, exist? Idi yeah, idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncrasies. Yep. And this is quite different. It's, it will not be with your employee, but it will be with your subcontractor, with your business partner. Mm. I would recommend to have everything written in Spanish and English. Oh. So both parties understand perfectly. So whenever we, I work with companies, everything, I put it in written in Spanish and English. Oh, wow. Sometimes... If I can in Italian, because I have this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Otherwise, but, my grandfather would kill me. But. Yeah, yeah. All, to all of us uh, displaced Italians, we say thank you. Some companies I have seen in the past, Dominic, they cannot trust a document in Spanish. And they, they do or they do not? Excuse me? They do or they do they not do trust? trust? They do trust anything written in Spanish because they cannot trust the counterpart in Mexico. Right. Again, I always recommend to have everything written in the two languages. This is very important. Yeah. I do. You know, I'm, I, I'm the same age as you, Pablo. I'm 50. And I've been doing business the same amount of time as you. Okay. The good You're news is younger, I, man. I keep learning. And the one thing I've learned again and again, is that when it comes down to two parties talking about a contract, it's the lowest common denominator of our relationship. For, at all costs, we should create a relationship where we don't have to go to the terms of the contract to get what we need done. We're mutually respectful. I'm doing what I do, you do what you do. But when we get down to the terms of the contract at that kind of discussion level, you probably have a, a, a sick, you know, not a healthy relationship. But you need a contract at the same time because that is the base. Yeah, because you do need it because you don't know what is going to happen. Yeah. Let me put it this way. Simple example. You do business with me. You're in Canada. I'm in Mexico. And for some reason, I get sick or I go around the world on a trip. And you yeah. will deal with my son, which is 25 years younger. It has a different business idea of, or he yeah. wants to do things differently, but he has to understand contract. When you have a business partner in a different country, and if it works, 
it would be a long-term relationship. But at some point in time, the next generation will take over. And, right. and you need a contract. I totally agree with you. If you need to go down to the contract, it's because something's wrong. Yeah. Well, but when something's wrong, you need the contract. <laughs> exactly. It goes hand in hand. Exactly. Pablo, I am so happy with the quality of information that you've provided today. I, I hope my listeners understand this global perspective you brought to the, the trade of, of our trade, and the international commerce of our trade. Okay. So thank you. There's, there's bound to be people who have questions and they want to reach out to you privately. How would, how would somebody find you? Okay, the, the best way to find me, it would be my email. Uh -huh. Maybe if, if you can kind of post it, it's Pablo, my name, P-A-B-L-O. Yep. Now, this is long. Maldonado, M-A-L-D-O-N-A-D-O, -A -A Maldonado. Right. At hlbpuebla.com. HLB. Puebla, P U E B L A. Yep. Dot com. I felt like in a, a spelling contest. <laughs> <laughs> or you, in, in the email, you will find the office numbers and right. you will find my mobile. I'm always there. I understand the, the, the change in, in, in timing. You guys are, I believe, two hours. I'm two hours ahead, right? Maybe. Well, I'm in, I'm in the Pacific time zone. And what, uh, what I mean, time well, right now we are 10 minutes to, to two o'clock in the afternoon. So you're the same time zone as Dallas? I'm the same time as Dallas, yes. Yeah, there you go. For people listening, that's the same time zone as Dallas or Winnipeg. <clears throat> I think Winnipeg. Well, Minneapolis, for example, is the same time. Yeah. So what I'll do, uh, for those of you listening who, didn't, who might be driving or walking your dog or you're at the gym listening while you're on the treadmill, uh, I will post Pablo's contact information in the show notes that go along with this particular episode. So it's easy to find. If you still can't find it, contact me directly and I have Pablo's info and I'll just mutually introduce you by email. Whatever works. If somebody has a question, I'll get them to you, Pablo. And you know what, Dominic? And this is, sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to seem informal, but sometimes your audience may have only a quick question. Well, a quick questions can be answered quickly, and it may help. Yeah. So if you guys have questions, something specific, please call us. It would be our pleasure to, to help you out. I, I love speaking with you. You're a wealth of knowledge, especially from a trans, you know, cross-border perspective, but also from business in general. I like the fact that you understand the, the automotive and the agricultural side because the, the bones of that trade is the bones that we need in any trade across those borders. So, okay. Thank you so much, so much, Pablo. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, let me sign off and say goodbye to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for checking in today and hearing about this, the impact of the USMCA as it, as it affects us across all the borders here in North America. Thanks, Pablo. Have a great day. We'll talk to you again Thank soon. You. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.